on the, the videotape uh, network that we have going, and uh, I'm glad that you're here this evening. We're on, if you have one of those little Bibles that's in the back of the room, we're on page 239. And it's in the New Testament. It's on Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. We're in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. And uh, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, if you've picked up the tapes where we've been before, we've arrived at that point of what we call nirvana, what we call Christ consciousness, what we call the higher realms, you know. And it says in Revelation 21, 7, he that overcomes shall inherit all things. Well, that's overcoming the lower aspects of the mind, rising into the higher aspects of the mind. It's not like it used to be many, many years ago where your meditation and your effort had to be so strong. Now you have something coming the opposite direction. Now you have this great planet Uranus. I guess it's one of the largest in the cosmos. This great thing that is lumbering across the skies, heading for its rendezvous, its celestial rendezvous with Aquarius, and that's what's causing all of the upheavals all over the world that you read about. That's what's making these unusual things happen that, that we've been seeing. That's what makes you feel the way you do. Right now, and, and I don't, can't go to each one of you anymore than I could this morning. We had a big crowd of people here this morning. But everyone was here because they're thinking differently. They feel differently. They don't feel the way they used to. They don't think about traditional concepts the way they used to. They don't, they don't feel tied to traditional values the way they used to because the traditional values have turned out to be a disaster. So, uh, you, you can't even get into traditional patriotism the way you used to. I was telling the folks this morning, oh, it's okay to say, oh, let's go over there and teach that guy a lesson. But I said, before you say that, just look back in our little room there where we have the kids playing with their toys during the service. And, and, and just instead of them being little American children, let them in your eyes be little Iraqi children playing with their box and their stuffed toys and their Ataris. And think that as our planes go over there, those little children are going to be blown to pieces. It's intolerable. It's not possible. You can't, you can't think that way anymore. There has to be another way. And what this, what we were talking about Uranus moving back into, into a tremendous power source in the universe. If we don't do it, it'll be done for us. It'll be done for us. So it's, it's time now to plug in. And when we get into discussing Uranus during the Friday night seminars on the Zodiac and the Bible, there'll be two aspects that you'll have. It'll show you what your life will basically be like if you open yourself to this pattern. And if you don't, what your life will basically be like. This is, I, I believe in my heart, the second coming of Christ that people have prayed for throughout their entire lives. And now's the time to look at it. But those who don't, those who get caught up in saying, well, no, I, I don't want to get involved in this. I want to stay with the entire thing. I had somebody write me, said they were resented the fact that on television I said, you know, taking communion uh, it didn't make any sense and has no purpose to it. And they thought that, that was a terrible thing to say. But I didn't say it. Jesus Christ said it. Jesus Christ says that what you put in your mouth cannot make you clean at all. He's the one that said it. But we've gotten to the point, you talk about traditionalism, that what he says doesn't make near as much of, a, of an impact on people as what the church says. The heck with what he says. We'll worry about what father so-and-so or pastor so-and-so or whomever he may be. That's what's important. And the results of it have been nothing but horror. And so what happens? What about those people? And what type of people, what type of situations, what type of mental situations will not find a place on the right side? And that's what we're talking. We're talking left, left brain versus right brain. We were talking about this morning the, uh, the vineyard. The vineyard is the right brain, the right hemisphere. And there's ample biblical evidence that it is. It was made with the right hand of God. It's east of Eden and all of these things. All of this stuff that says it's on the right side. I just can't go into it, but you can collect the tapes or whatever and see for yourself. Revelation 21, 8 talks about those types of qualities which will not be allowed or cannot enter into the higher place. And we've gotten to the part of sorcerers. Sorcerers. Do you see that? Revelation 21, 8. Sorcerers. Sorcerers are deceivers, using things to move men's emotions and, and making people believe that they've seen something holy. I used to, I've seen that. I remember in the old days, in the old charismatic days, I, we used to watch, we'd get a, somebody's leg sticking up and the one leg would be about a quarter of an inch and they'd pray on it and the thing would come out like that and everybody would go hallelujah and jumping up and down. And I thought, <laughs> I said, this is it, this is a miracle. I, I, this is, I've seen it with my own eyes. And I remember calling up a friend of mine who was a pastor of a church down in South Jersey, down around your neck of the woods, down around Barkington. I said, Gene, you've got to see this. You know what I'm talking about? I said, you've got to see it. You never, I saw it with my own eyes. He says, it's the greatest trick in the world. Do whatever you want. Just get somebody to sit down, stick their legs out. 
say hocus pocus, and before you know it, it'll come. But it's deceit then. I said, if that's, if that's true, then the body will just normally set itself like that, and that leg will come out, then you're deceiving people. In other words, you're showing people something, you're deliberately making them look to think there's a great miracle, when actually all you're looking at is a reaction of the human body. Sorcery. Here's something interesting for you. Pope Sylvester II was publicly accused by Cardinal Byrne of being a sorcerer because he had made heads on his papal hats that seemed to speak. On his papal hat, he had little heads on it, and somehow he contrived it, so it made it look like they were talking from God. Oh, go ahead. Oh, hey, wait a minute. Don't get upset. Don't freak out with me. Oh, hey, don't send me letters. You look in the book. It's historical. It's, a, it's happened. I mean, that would really get you, you know. If you did come in and you're in the big sanctuary to pray down, oh, you know, will there be a word from God? And the guy's top of the hat starts speaking. It's says, like, hey, you, Jack, you better knock off what you're doing. That would get you. I ain't going to do it no more. Gregory VII was known as a sorcerer who could shake lightning out of his sleeve. Now, there's a good one. What did he have going? Sorcery is part of the Bible. Listen to me. The Bible is filled with sorcery. It's the use of normal physical things, giving them a power to go beyond the divine power. Look at page 39 of your little Bibles in the Old Testament back to Genesis. <clears throat> back to Genesis, and you go to Genesis 44. Genesis 44. I'm going to read you, and you're going to read about the guy who saved the 12 tribes of Israel. In other words, if it wasn't for this guy, there would be no Israel, no country of Israel, no 12 tribes of Israel. This was Joseph. And he literally saved the 12 brothers from extinction. If it wasn't for him, they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't have survived, and you wouldn't have had Israel, the country of Israel as you know it now. Genesis 44, verse 5. Somebody has stolen or he had gotten rid of his silver cup, Joseph. And here somebody found it and it says, Is not this it, the cup, in which my Lord drinks, and whereby indeed he divineth? You see that? That's Joseph's silver cup. He divineth. You know what Joseph used to do? He used to take colored water. He used to take dye and put it in the water. And he'd stir it up. And whichever way the color settled, he'd say, that's what you should do. He'd read that cup. This was the guy that say, this was the guy who was most favored by God. He was a fortune teller. Do you see it in the Bible? Do you see where it says he divineth? That's what divineth. Do you ever hear about a divining rod and all that? That's what they did. He divineth by using a cup, by putting colors in the cup, and then he read people's fortunes, and he said, this is what to do. He's the hero of the Bible. This, they, made a, they made a play out of him, the electric color dream coder, Joseph in the coat of many colors. This is the guy. He was a fortune teller. And if it wasn't for him, the 12 tribes of Israel would have gone right down the old chute. Never made it. Take a look at uh, page 72 in your little Bible. And the rest of you go to Exodus 28. Exodus 28, okay? Page 72. Now here you got two things right here. Take a look up here. You got a Urim and you got a Thummim. Okay? Exodus 28, verse 30. And here's the order from the high priest. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Now, in other words, Aaron was not allowed as the high priest to go into the Holy of Holies before the Lord without the Urim and the Thummim. Do you know what they were? Dice! They were dice. They were two little blocks with marks on them. And he went in, and he would go before the Lord, and you would ask him a question. Oh, great high priest, what shall I do with my wife? She's given me a lot of trouble. And the, he would walk in there, roll snake eyes, and come out and say, Hey, Gavant, I got news for you, boy, what you should do. It's sorcery. And it's part of the Bible, and Moses would not allow a high priest into the Holy of Holies without the Urim and Thummim. They put them in their breastplate, and they were two little square things, and they had dots on them, and they would move them around, and that would divine to them the will of God. If you look on page 419 in your little Bible, and if the rest of you find your way to the book of Nehemiah, what's that after, uh, Sue? Is that after... Jer huh? 
Just before Job. Wait a minute, now come with me. Uh -huh. All right, Nehemiah, well, the rest of you know, okay, the rest of you, it's on page, what I'm looking for is on page 419 in your little Bible, okay? And here you are in Nehemiah chapter 7, and at Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 65, and the Tirashah said that unto them, that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with the Urim and the Thummim. In other words, don't do anything until he rolls the dice. It's exactly what they were. Now that can be very upsetting to people. People who, who are traditionalists over the years and have said, my goodness gracious, but you know, the people will get mad at me, horribly mad at me, for saying something like this. And yet it's the truth. That's exactly what they were. How did, when uh, Judas died, how do you think the remaining 11 apostles chose the next apostle? They drew straws. The guy that got the short straw got stuck with the job. His name was Matthias. He was never heard from since. But that's what they did. That's sorcery. They drew straws. And here's the word. Let me just, because I, I have it written down. It's S-O-R-T-I-L-E-G-I-U-M. Sorligium, I guess it's called. And it is divining by lots. Divining by lots. And the Bible's filled with it. Can you imagine something as important as this? In other words, say, for instance, I got hit by a bolt of lightning and I was no longer in this world. Who would fill this place? Who would come up here and rally with all of this wild stuff? Well, you know, we'll do, what we'll do is we'll just take whoever gets a short straw gets the job. That's what they did. Uh, and you, uh, okay. Rather than you listening to me, go to page 113 in the New Testament. And for the rest of you, look at the book of Acts. Okay. Look at the book of Acts and go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 26. And you'll see how they selected Matthias. Page 113, Acts chapter 1, verse 26. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. There you go. They drew lots and he got the job. Now, are you going to sit there and tell, this is God's holy book. Do you think this really is the way that a God in a holy heaven would like his holy people to be selected? Whoever gets a short straw gets the job. Or do you honestly think that it would be the favor of an eternal, loving, caring God in the universal cosmos somewhere that his preachers shoot dice or throw colored water in a cup to see how things are going to come out. But they did. They did. And basically, you can see how it wound up. How many of you ever heard of St. Augustine? Let me quote you St. Augustine. Wonderful man. He even named a town after him in Florida. Here's what he said. I do not disapprove of divination as long as it is not used for worldly purposes. In other words, shooting dice and drawing lots and all of that kind of stuff, as long as it is not used for worldly purposes. And historically, St. Augustine admitted that he practiced divination. But then why do you or how can you come against somebody that uses a Ouija board? What in the heck's the difference? What's the difference? Because you're a high priest, you go in and shoot dice and you come out and tell everybody what to do. Or somebody sits down and gets it from a Ouija board. What's the difference? <coughs> Manufacturing a spiritual essence out of physical things is sorcery, and it says in Revelation it isn't going to go. Because you cannot manufacture anything. That's the problem with taking advice from people. You have to test everything in meditation above thought because everybody that gives you advice, everybody that teaches you anything, anybody that tells you anything is working out of the carnal mind. Right now that I'm telling you this stuff, it's coming right out of the carnal mind. And so what do you have to do? Do you have to say, well, I don't know if I believe it. I don't want you to believe it. I'm not here to tell you to believe anything. I'm just saying this stuff. But I hope that this stuff will make you be curious enough that you'll get into this and you'll start to explore this and you'll meditate and you'll go into the presence of the Spirit because you must be true to your own self. You must know truth for yourself. Not that I say it's true. You can check anything I say. You can go to the library, check anything. I have no reason to make up stories. For what? 
But you have a responsibility to stay away from saying, I believe what so-and-so said, or I believe what this group says, or I don't believe what this group says. You have to go to the source within you, raising yourself up into that right side by shutting down the left and hearing truth. From the divine God who dwells within you, and the only place in the universe that God exists is in you. There is none outside, anywhere. He's in you, and every single one of you, Then, and this is the line that I love, that that Bhagwan God, you are all Buddhas pretending to be somebody else. And I would say contemporarily, every one of you is Jesus Christ pretending not to be. And my job is to expose you for who you really are. Christ. And once you find out that you're not the body that you dwell in, that you're not the personality that you're dealing with, but that you are a sacred, holy, loving, kind, and filled with wisdom Christ, and allow that to birth for, uh, burst forth, that not only does your life change, but the entire universe changes, the entire planet changes. The planet heaven, planet earth becomes the planet heaven. Revelation 21.8, idolaters will not get in. Giving power to God's symbols and dwelling on the symbols instead of the truth they represent no good. Baptism. How important is it for you to get baptized? I have known people who have gotten baptized in water, they get sick. What is, why would, what kind of a screwy God is there that says, unless this girl gets her head dunked in water, she's not going to heaven? Dunk her head in. I mean, She's done everything good. She's done, oh, she's done, she's been so good. She's raised the kids. She's been kind to Jack. She kisses, oh, she's such a nice person. Why couldn't she go to heaven? She can't go to heaven because she didn't get her head dumped in the water. That's why. She ain't going. You get her dumped or she ain't going. Why? Because that's why. What's the reason for it? Let me show you the reason for it. <laughs> Earth, water, air fire, new mind. That's the five stages of consciousness in Greek. That's where the whole thing comes from. The earth is your lowest mind. The water is the second stage where you start to perceive truth. The third is air, which is above the thoughts of the mind. The fourth is fire, which is spirit. And the fifth is the culmination of the renewed mind. That's the five stages in Greek. You must take the lower mind, lift it to the second level, which is water, the higher truth that begins in meditation by which you will then rise out of the water or the second stage of consciousness into the air or the third stage where you are above human thought. Once you've hit that third stage, you can then rise to the fourth stage, which is fire, and be touched by the Holy Spirit. That's what baptism is and nothing else. It has nothing whatsoever to do with touching wet water. It has to do with touching the second stage of consciousness in the human brain. But we have given power to the water. Barnegat Bay has some power. It sure does, but it's not going to get you to heaven. And if you see, you can also see here where it says that we will rise from the earth and meet Jesus in the... Right, right there. Third stage of consciousness. That's where he dwells, above the thoughts of the mind. And you can also see where you are, you are baptized in water and then in fire. And Jesus said, unless you are baptized by water and fire, you cannot. Because what? You submit your consciousness to water, which is the second level, and then you rise up to the fourth level, which is fire. Here's another. Here's something else you'll see that they've distorted Armageddon. What happens in Armageddon? Fire, the fourth stage of consciousness, comes down onto the earth. So there you have fire, which is the higher spirit within you, coming down to destroy the things in your lower mind which have hurt you and kept you in bondage. That's what, that's what Armageddon's about, that's what baptism's about, that's what being born by fire and spirit's about. And if you look into that fourth stage, which in Greek is fire, and go over to the way the Christians interpret it, you're saying that the fourth stage in Christianity is the Holy Ghost. And that is nothing more than the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you raise yourself into meditation and lift yourself up into the fire. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Do you see? The baptism of water is rising up into the second stage of consciousness. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is rising up into the fourth stage of consciousness, and none of that is possible unless you meditate. can't be done. It cannot be done because there's no way to get to that third stage of consciousness unless you meditate. <coughs> it's not possible to do it. What about circumcision? What about it? Cutting away the outer desire. 
The Apostle Paul said, hey, you know, hey, circumcision is not of the flesh, but of the heart. You cut away the outer desire. And once you cut away the outer desire, then, of course, you're able to go into the holy place. But are you going to dwell on these things? So somebody gets circumcised, the male gets circumcised, big deal, what happened? Ouch, that's all, what is that going to do? What is that going to do? Where, is that, where does that fit in to God or heaven or spirituality? Any more than dunking your head in the barn and get bay. So what do we do? We clip, clip little boys, we dunk people's heads in the water and say we're saved. And just that, that should be enough to say what kind of lunacy are we involved in here? It's what, this God wants little boys' parts to be snipped off and he wants people to dunk their head in the water and it's going to turn this guy on. That's not what it is. And you can see as you begin to understand the symbolisms and the mystical uh, things surrounding these signs, what it really, resurrection of the dead. What do we look for? People are actually waiting for Christ to come back and everybody to jump out of the graves. All these graves around here are going to blow open and all these dead bodies are going to come out. What kind of a greeting is that? Do you really want to be around when that happens? I don't want to be here. I want to get out of here. Go to, go, do they have, I don't want to be around here. Hey, Jesus is coming back, and all of these ghouls are running up the street, you know, like you see, remember, see all these zombies? I'm going, you know. <laughs> Resurrection of the dead. We look to the grave for real dead bodies to come out of the grave instead of dead ideas to rise out of your mind. That's what it means. The resurrection of the dead is that dead mind which is bondaged with nothingness, swimming in a ball going nowhere, suddenly leaping like a dolphin out of the water up into the air, resurrecting up into the higher consciousness where God dwells. That's the resurrection of the dead. And what does it say? When the flesh is crucified, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, what happens? The graves burst open because once that flesh is crucified, you raise yourself out of the grave or the lower bondage of the flesh up into the higher realms of divine consciousness, the resurrection of the dead. You know that's true. You know doggone well there's no God planning to come down here with his son and have a happy occasion by all these dead bodies climbing out of graves. In the first place, my friends, you are not the body that you're in. That's not you. It's a mask. When you finally learn and lift yourself up into the center, you will meet you. That's the eternal life. That's the part of you that lives forever. That's the part of you that will be recognized by God because it is God. Oneness with him, not the body. The body is manipulated by people. I was telling folks the other day uh, how the mask we wear, and it was a story about, you know, if you're on a, an airplane and you're sitting next to this guy and you're shooting the bull and you're kind of using, you know, your language, hey, how you doing? And a stewardess comes down and says, uh, would you care to have another uh, coffee, Senator Johnson? No, I don't think it was. All of a sudden, you're put on a different mask. You're Senator Johnson? Washington? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I used to be, and I was going to go in politics, Senator Johnson. The whole garbage, the whole new mask comes out. The whole new person. Mm -hmm. Now, Senator Johnson, he stays there sitting reading his book. He, he doesn't have to change, <laughs> but I have changed mine. <laughs> you're Senator Johnson, huh? <laughs> How are you? I, I voted for you, Senator. Yes, I, yeah. You didn't, you liar, but you, I voted for you, Senator. And this is what it is. You're all manipulated. You live up to what the society has in you know, Oh, God, if you can meet the Senator. You should have seen us when we were in Key West, okay, down by our dock of this apartment that we were running. There was a boat in the power race, the offshore power race. You know who owned the boat? Down there, Don Johnson and Kurt Russell. And this blonde was upstairs saying, Go get an autograph. I says, I can't. I don't know what to say. Oh, great. You know, the one thing I ask, I have to make all the phone calls, and you won't go down and get an autograph. So there I am with the picture of Kurt Russell down there with my little pencil. And, uh, you know. Where is he? Well, he didn't come on him. So he's, he's, he's walking. You know, you say stupid stuff when you're in a big movie. So I don't even know who the guy was, a big movie. So comes, you know, he comes out of his boat, you know, he's a macho guy. So what do you say? Said something real intelligent, big movie stuff. He's walking about just far from here. I says, 
Hi, Kurt. This is Joan. <laughs> <That's a> <laughs> <laughs> what else are you going to say? But you know, it, you know you, I became a completely different person. Here I am, the great mystic. <laughs> this, uh, I am touching God in the realms of nirvana and mysticizing and teaching all of the flock how to reach, reach up into Uranus and all of these things. <laughs> Next thing, I'm down at the dock like a, a regular tourist with my little sneakers and no socks on and my blue <laughs> bathing suit. Hi, Kurt. <laughs> Sign my book, you know. Good night. But we change. See? So we do whatever we're conditioned to do by the society that we live in. So when you give power to the symbol, you miss it. How many times have you had people anoint the head with oil? And that's important. You know, you get oil and you put it on, I'll put, she, pick on her, put oil on her head. Done nothing. All you've done is make her head greasy. That's all you've done. That's all you've done. You put some grease on her head. Oil symbolizes spirit. It is anointed means touch the consciousness, touch the head, touch the higher consciousness with spirit. If I come to you and I am able to get into your consciousness, the reality of the spirit that which is you, the I am, which is God dwelling within you, I have anointed you with oil. Not real oil. See, that's why Paul got so ticked off. Let me show you something. Find the book of Hebrews in your Bible. Find the book of Hebrews in your Bible. Okay, and I'll show you something very interesting. It's on, in fact, I can tell you what page it's on. 203 in your little Bible. And incidentally, for those of you who are watching on television, you cannot go to the store and order a little Bible. There's no such thing. They, they, who has one? See how little it is compared to my big, intelligent Bible? Uh, it's, it's, uh, we call them little Bibles because they're, they're little. Yeah. Hebrews, are you with me? 203 in your little Bible. And here's what Paul says about it. Hebrews 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ. How do you like that? Leave the principles of the doctrines of Christ. Let us go on to perfection. And forget this stuff of the foundation of repentance from dead works. Of faith. To, you're not even supposed to have faith towards God. Forget it. Get away from it. Why? Because you are God. You're one with God. Why should you have faith? You should know. You should be part of it. You exist with it. I used to have people say, oh, you've got to have faith in God. Jesus Christ sat with the 12 disciples and said to these guys, look, this is what's going to happen. They're going to kill me. But three days, I'm going to rise out of the grave. Yeah, right. Not one of them showed up. Not one of them showed up. How much faith did they have? 2,000 years later, you're going to have faith. These guys were right there. They didn't even take a pair of binoculars. Not even sneak up behind a tree to see, maybe. Where were they? Shooting pool out, whatever they were doing. They, they weren't around. Not one of them showed up. And that's it's very specific. Not one of them showed up. See? So it says, look, of, of the doctrine of baptisms. You see where it says in Hebrews 6, uh, 6 2? Of the doctrine of, and of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do. In other words, go on to perfection. And perfection is the place above the human mind. Perfection is the place above the human mind. We call Jerusalem the holy city. Look what we, where's that, uh, does anybody have the paper that I was using to wipe off the, uh... oh, the great disappearing act happened again. Here, look, look at this. <coughs> Jerusalem. Now, the Apostle Paul told you that Jerusalem, which is in over in the Holy, is just a city. That's nothing. You, 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 how many of you said that the Jews are the chosen people? Is that right? Then God discriminates on the basis of, of race. Why would he pick just because a person's a Jew? Why? Because, look, when you set the uh, north, south, east, and west in Numbers 2-2, two, two, over to the east, he put the tribe of Judah. Over to the east, to the right. See, when you look north, the east is on the right. That was the positioning of the camp of the tribe of Judah. So those who dwell in the east, those who dwell at the right hemisphere, are the chosen people. Israel, as I showed you this morning, is not a Jewish word at all. Israel is an Egyptian word. It is made up of three words, three Egyptian gods. It is made up of Isis, who is the spirit, and Ra, who is the mind, and from the Mithra bull cult, El, which means God which manifests in the flesh. 
So Israel has nothing to do with the country. It has to do with that which is within you. Spirit and mind unified to produce the God who is within you. That's what Israel is. And Jew, mean being the chosen people, is a derivation from that tribe of Judah, which was positioned in the east or at the right side in the encampment. And you can read about the encampment in Numbers 2 too. The tribe of Judah was at the east. The tribe of Dan, representing the emotional nature, was at the north. The tribe of Reuben, which represents the spirit, um, physical nature in the south, and the tribe of Ephraim, which represented the intellectual nature, was in the west. Why was the intellectual nature was in the west? That's the brain. That's your intellect. That's the left side. Here's the right side, Judah, of the east. It says right in Numbers 2, 2, at the point of the rising sun. Why is it like this? Because it is the intellectualism. It's when you start to figure this out that the darkness comes and overwhelms that which comes from the sun. Right now, if you go outside, you'll find that the west has overwhelmed the east. The darkness has overwhelmed the sun. When you start to get intellectual about this, instead of just meditating and just going into the present, you're intellectualizing, and what you're going to do is bring darkness. You're going to get so smart about this stuff, you're going to miss it. You're going to get so smart about it, you're going to put the lights out. That's why the, <clears throat> the intellect is positioned in the west, and the spirit is positioned in the east, because it is the darkness which comes from the east and west that overwhelms that which is the sun in the east. Okay. And so these are all symbols which have no power at all. But they do have a training power to teach you. In other words, when somebody says anoint your oil, you should find out what the head symbolizes, what oil symbolizes, and understand the truth. When they talk about baptism and water, you should find out what water symbolizes, what baptism means, and why you're supposed to rise up into the air. But we've never done it. We've taken it literally, and the Apostle Paul said, be not a minister of the letter. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And the entire Bible says, don't take it literally. Jesus Christ says he never speaks but in parables. It says in Psalm 78, God speaks in parables. Proverbs 1, 6 says, Wisdom is understanding the sayings of the ancients and their dark sayings. <coughs> it says in, in Galatians 4, 24, that the Old Testament's allegorical. And yet we take it literally, and by doing so, we deprive ourselves of the truth. We deprive ourselves of the truth. Let's do one more, and then we're, we're out. Finally, the group would finish up. I just wanted to do Revelation 21, 8 and finish it. You see, you people are wondering when the book of Revelation was going to end. We didn't even get through one uh, thing tonight. Oh, well. Revelation 21. <laughs> Here's the last one that won't make it. Liars. Liars are those who actually believe in their lies, okay? They call good evil. They call evil good. But where did the lies come from? <clears throat> in John 8.44, page 97 in your New Testament in the Little Bible, John 8.44, look what it says. Book of John 8, verse 44, page 97 in your Little Bible. You are of your father, the devil. Okay? Now that's a... That's an interesting thing, because Jesus is saying, you are of your father, the devil. And, of course, the word devil is simply evil. You see that word? You see the word evil? The word evil is 